Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. In our number eight spot today, we have the groom of the stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title. It weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods. You know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the groom of the stool comes in. This high level nobleman would would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number seven spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous, too. I mean, if we really think about what exactly they were doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease, and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number six spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. You know, both bad. In our number five spot today, we have the executioner. We've all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. Well, there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people. History shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed
put upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number three spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connection were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone and and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough, for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else. Number 10, watch party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly, no. Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible. The first Tsar of Russia. 
A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose? Think again, pal. That's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside, sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. Wouldn't be done. Krakows, or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. And I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's beat? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, a squire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back in your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. Here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well-being and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones. It was pitch black. It was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle. And most of the time, you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? 
disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone? No thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows? Maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying. Number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible. Get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person, and still in the punishment, begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already, and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start, and where, and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or the Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic, if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like, this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the Middle Ages had some good traditions, along with like, how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army 
army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn, and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really? Was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know... Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus, so she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good. The middle age, greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 15th 61, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed 
their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the Dark Ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bear is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Because anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back. So, <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this is a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this there was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest at least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals. They wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Number 10, hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spine needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. 
Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different. It's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, public de-lifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common. That's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re me, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I'm moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> Villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what, you know? Like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people. Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that, don't, don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, dad's happy with it, mom's happy, you got a blushing bride, what more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch, like they just subbed to yield the OnlyFans? 
No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just, do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring you down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale, like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. Doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't don't lose your blood for to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen in TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, at it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Yeah, chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Number 10, Andrew, is, uh, is this you? What? There is no lighter way to put this. We talked about a court jester or a fool, but did you know that some medieval royal courts had professional farters? Yes, that's people whose sole purpose in life was to fart. I'm still trying to figure out how Andrew can fart on command, but these guys did it as a job. These guys would fart their way to being rewarded with houses and lands for their fartscapades. Fartscapades that would include passing their intestinal wind in unique, creative, musical, or amusing ways. <laughs> I, wonder if, I wonder if the mic picked that up. This quote I found from St. Augustine in City of God says, these talented individuals had, quote unquote, such a command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. The most famous of the medieval flatulists, no, that's not a joke, that's actually what they're called, was Roland the Farter from Hemingstone Manor in the county of Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, who could shoot water up to five feet? He could squirt water out of his bum while farting. Ready? Get some water. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, arrange marriages. Today, the marriage industry makes millions every year. Flowers, design, and of course, the bridal dresses. It's a good business, especially once the weather starts to warm up. You got options today, ladies. Sleeves or no sleeves, veil or no veil, and thousands of other dress designs that I simply just don't understand. But the beauty of it all is that you get to marry the man of your dreams. Hi. <laughs> I'm not the man of their dreams, let's be honest. <laughs> or at least the best smelling one in your social circle. Definitely not me. However, for the ladies of the past, they sometimes didn't get to pick their man as her family or royal court would. A lot of marriages, especially on the high ups, were often more of a political move than that of a romantic one. Sure, marrying for an alliance sounds cool, but man, dinner time would be like a blind date every night. That's, that's just super awkward. So like, uh, like where are you from? What's going on? Yeah. Number eight, ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, 
whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice. It could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, War of the Bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially due to the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like Bologna, but it's Modena. I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the Emperor, one supporting the Pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes. <laughs> Ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil. Get him! Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples as sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police. Uh oh. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtev. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner, and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number four, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of defender of the faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here, too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic community, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and Oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, 
the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics, and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queasy at night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time a side in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Kick it off the list at number 10, Black Cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly, you know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory the Ninth, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet, or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, Basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village or even from two different opposing villages and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse, or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. What? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. 
Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War, what is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I'm gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pill Mm -hmm. Yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is going to cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice. Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, 
That didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, Destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering, or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes, they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our Number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carting, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that, because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. Number 8. Taxes Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William I, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah. This was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard I, 
leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah. Back then, the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. PETA would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat for a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> Gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah. Prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your Honor, a small recess please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Number five, the Great Charter. Ah uh, yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty, the initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow. Like, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Templars. Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. Also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private Private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter and 
tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Pateur was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town. And no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, so this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, there is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment such a game to be used in the city in the future. Picking off the list at number 10, the Heretic's Fork. Ah uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck right off the bat, here we go. The Heretic's Fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst in my opinion because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment and then no one has to even be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty horrible fork, would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim Victim has to keep their neck straight or else the obvious and horrible would happen. Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The Heretic's Fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device. Yeah, it was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties, but finally this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Leslie Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, beavers. It's my national animal and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states who for sure eat this but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough, it's not actually 
an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kinda how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond, and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like that's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, is, uh, is wiener von schnitzel minor. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal. Even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms out there who do great work. You're the best. Way to go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point. It's kind of gross, but at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious. Enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep gabagool while you're at it. Why not? You know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grouping ruling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders, and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals, and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner, and on top of that, they're sewing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things. Then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and... Well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a entrail pie? Oh. That must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great, you guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions, and honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun, and watching reality TV shows, when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention, and its hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then. Thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, 
and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just want to pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please! More like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Dude, gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty, uh, pretty gross right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around. They're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. She she thought she was preparing a meal for her family, when really she was about to poison them. Now it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip thankfully before her family, and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599, when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people of course starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, they didn't starve to death. Illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day. It was horrible. Number eight, barber for a brain transplant. No, not actually. I don't think they even knew what a brain transplant was, let alone how to perform one. But in the Middle Ages, barbers were not just responsible for cutting your hair and giving monks that lovely bald thing going on top. No, they were also responsible for tending to the wounded after doing battle, taking care of the sick, and all the other medical services that the actual physicians were too good for. It's actually the reason we see those red and white spinning signs outside barbers because it's symbolic of the bloody rags they would use to show that they could do the bloodletting required of monks in the Middle Ages. These barbers even formed a guild in the 13th century, lasting all the way up to the 18th century. Barbers are talented individuals. No one can cut my hair the way Tony does. Number seven, jesters. If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that stuff ain't good for it, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses. That's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? Me and, and Adam, the Jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The Jesters, the Jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the Jester. The Jester's job was to jest, laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because, well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the Jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The Jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six. Everybody drinking. I recently went to go pick up some beers, and I went up to the cashier and I got my debit card out and prepped my ID. The cashier asked me, how do you want to pay? And I handed him my ID, being so accustomed to being confused for a prepubescent younger lad. He looked at me confused and said, nah, you're good bro, and boom, embarrassment. This interaction would never take place back in the medieval times, because literally everyone was able to drink. 
It was usually the case to drink beer or wine and it was usually the case to drink beer or wine in place of clean water. Now they did have clean water before you all jump on me in the comments, but for when it wasn't on hand, beer and wine was accepted in its place. It was a common part of the medieval diet. I think they convinced themselves of this in the same way I tell myself it's okay to have another one. Well, it's made of greens with water, so that means it's healthy, right? Red wine is good for my heart, so drinking it right out of the bottle is okay, right? No, probably not. Number five, helmeted chicken. Wind the clock back 10 years ago. I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime, I was gonna watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel, you should check it out. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the Medieval Times had their own version of a turducken. It, sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off-putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four, going to the schedule de -lifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need, from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment, music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er-do-well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely, with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. I'll pass. Number three, witch trials. Speaking of scheduled de-lifing, witch trials, or rather, uh, get rid of anyone who's been deemed a witch, which, in case you didn't know, was uh, as simple as this. Right then, the young woman down the lane is smarter than her boys in the school. Right then, folks, pitchforks and torches it is. Unfortunately, for a lot of women at the time, it was tough. When has it not been, right ladies? While some men were declared witches too, this was a tool really for people with power to get rid of those who dare oppose them. There's too many royals to mention who took part in this, however, one stands out as bloody Queen Mary. Names like this were not given for no reason. She was known for sending witches and heretics alike to the stake to be cooked. Number two, outlaw. In movies and TV, characters named as outlaws, specifically in the Wild West sense, are seen as cool guys, outsiders, and wanderers with an air of mystery and possibly power. Trust me when I say it was not what you wanted to be, especially in the medieval times. If you were declared an outlaw in the Middle Ages, you lost all rights, possessions, and any kind of protection being part of society would give you, including people getting in trouble for ending your stay on this plane of existence. You were forced to fend for yourself with nothing to your name, and in a world rife with disease, wars, bandits, and very little readily available food or water, things get harsh quick. If you didn't have a buddy to turn to for help, who you knew for a fact would not literally stab you in the back, then you were pretty screwed. Luckily, I have Andrew. Right? Yeah! Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill, and now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. I joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. 
Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they are just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you want to be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now, so maybe maybe be a lawyer. Call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight, and like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of black plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number eight. Keys to the city. You know when people say that someone got the keys to the city as a way of saying that person can do whatever they want? Well that came from the medieval times. You see, back in ye olden times, if you lived in a walled city when nighttime hit, they locked those gates up tight. Don't want some slimy bandits, enemy soldiers, or unwanted fletulists coming and going in the city in the dead of the night. Someone who was particularly well liked or who had done something noteworthy to gain the respect, trust, and admiration of the people would be given a key to the city, giving them the free reign to come and go as they please. We actually still do this, but obviously most cities don't really have walls anymore, so it's more of a symbolic thing like, hey, you're great, have this little key that opens literally nothing. You're welcome. Number seven, graveyards. If you're like me, then you've seen enough zombie movies to know that hanging around a graveyard is the last place you want to be. It's their spawn point, duh. And every time you drive by a graveyard, you think to yourself, some zombie related thoughts, but dare not tell anyone for fear of sounding like a weird guy for talking about zombies rising out of the graves because it's sunny out and that's, that just sounds like a tale from the crypt episode. Well, medieval people didn't have fears of George A. Romero's movies or that weird corpse guy in Tales of the Crypt Keeper, as people like to hang out in the graveyards. Weird, I know. In medieval times, they were just a part of the town. There weren't really a lot of fences or like barriers. Sometimes there would be plays, small festivals, and even shops set up in graveyards since graveyard shops pay no tax. I guess you could say shop till you drop it. <laughs> All bad impressions aside, I'll stay away, especially with the diseases going around back then. Number six, cat burning. Excuse me, yeah, boy. Medieval people just hated cats. A lot of the ye old people thought cats were symbols or allies of the big red with the horns. And yeah, they aren't the most pleasant of animals, but I love my cat. Yeah. Not that one. Unfortunately, in the Middle Age France, it was custom to burn a barrel full of live cats over a burning fire every Midsummer's Eve, as people shrieked with laughter and danced around with glee. French kings often witnessed it and even ceremoniously started the fire. But they did much more than that too, like King Charles IX who threw a live fox onto the fire for added variety. Or in 1648, France's King Louis XIV, then aged just 10, lit the tinder on a large bonfire in central Paris, then watched and danced with glee as a basket of stray cats was lowered into the flames. A man who wrote to his brother about the celebration of coronation of Queen Elizabeth I wrote, Last Saturday, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was solemnized in the city with mighty bonfires and the burning of a most costly pope carried by four persons in diverse clothing, his belly filled full of live cats who squalled most hideously as soon as they felt the fire. What the hell? Number five, castles. 
Besides a knight in shining armor, what's the first thing you think of when you think of medieval times? Castles! Yeah, obviously. Yes, I'm talking about castles, but bear with me here. Just hear me out. Okay, so when we were kids, we all wanted to live in a huge mansion, right? I mean, who doesn't? I wouldn't, though, because, well, it would be a pain in the neck to clean. As you grow up, you start thinking about weird things like that. It would be really difficult to clean. But it's a common wish nonetheless. Well, castles basically are medieval mansions, except with a little twist. These Castles are also designed with military strategy in mind. So imagine, if you will, you have a world where your parents have a mansion, uh, but they had to add guard towers and an armory and a battalion of soldiers just in case the next kingdom over gets a, a little too frisky. The positioning of the castle was also very important too. Some built by the coast on top of hills and even some inside of mountains all in the name of protection. To me, that's like some purge level reality where wealthy homes have to be built with defenses in mind. It's kind of messed up. Number four, fair. Punishments for crime in the Middle Ages were different from they are today. Capital punishment happens now still, like it did then, but we don't really put people into exile so much anymore. Unless you count the prison system, but th that's another conversation altogether. Back in medieval Ireland though, someone who de lifed someone else and was judged to be guilty was given to the deceased's family as their unwilling servant. That is, if they failed to pay the oodles of money required to buy their freedom. As we know, people who were forced into manual labor were not treated too nicely. And they were pretty much had no rights at all, being seen as property more than an individual. This means that the family that now owns said person could do whatever they wanted with them. Their life was basically forfeit. Now, if the person who ended the life of one of your beloved family members was now given to you to do whatever you wanted with them, what would you do? Yes, yes, me too, mm -hmm. probably. It seems fair to me. Leave the punishment to those who are most affected by the crime. Number three, Shark Week. Aunt Flo, she shows up sometimes during those delightful few days that ladies have. I hear you, I know. I'm not a lady, I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to relate to the audience. But have you ever wondered how things were dealt with before the modern world of feminine hygiene products? Today, you got options, but back then, well, they didn't really exist. Ladies had to come up with methods, and honestly, the beginnings of what the products would eventually evolve into. A lot of times, it was extra cloth or rags were used, perhaps where the expression on the rag may have come from. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no issue talking about this because it's natural. It's a part of life. I'm a grown-up, dude. The tradition of this point is in the tradition of hiding it or being ashamed. That's what started in medieval times, too, unfortunately. And sadly, it's carried over to today just a little bit. Some even consider cramps to be a punishment for Eve's original sin back then, which is just so stupid. Things have gotten a little better, but I, I think you can all agree with me, ladies. It's time for everyone else to grow up a little bit. A number two, trick or treat, it's Christmas. What? <laughs> Sorry. In Northern Europe and Scandinavian countries, Yule time meant adopting the tradition we are familiar with from modern Halloween. Dressing up like your favorite spooky characters, or what it is now, trying to one-up your friends with the hottest insert occupation here costume you can. They didn't dress up as sexy cats or nurses though. But from the day of Christmas to the 12th night, young men would dress up according to, quote unquote, the old fashion of the devil, and go around in the night scaring people in the streets. These young spunky lads would go about as ghosts, trolls, or other strange creatures. And in the 16th and 17th century, some men would even dress as the Yule Goat, terrifying children and coming into people's houses demanding cake or cheese, then pleasantly thanking them if he received something, or whacking them with a stick if he didn't. Then the goat would just hop on out of there like this. That was cute, dude. Thanks, man. Number one, Lord's Right. This one is just so messed up. Okay, so back in the medieval times, imagine if you will that you've just been married to a beautiful woman. Just finished walking down the aisle when the local lord of the land makes a surprise appearance at your wedding. At first you bow and welcome his lordship. That's when he grabs your blushing bride-to-be and looks at you with the snobbiest look a royal could and says, sorry bud, lord's right, gotta take her for a test drive to make sure everything's great. Yes, that's right, there was a law, or a code, if you will, that allowed lords to entertain wives for a few hours. Or like a few seconds. You must also imagine this is a time when speaking out against lords for doing so would not have bode well for you or your wife, so let's just go along with the plan. Number 10, saving your pee-pee. Back in the day, whole families, monasteries, and public meeting places would collect the pee-pee deposited in chamber pots throughout the day. Yummy. They would take the amassed forbidden lemonade and either donate it, or if they were feeling enterprising, they could sell the wee wee to the town tanner or fuller. You see, the warm yellow liquid was used for the process of dyeing textiles and in the tanning of hides. Oh, 
and it was also used for cleaning clothes. Screw the smell of Tide and bounce dryer sheets, I'll take the smell of wetting the bed and grandpa's favorite chair. Thank you very much. Urine was also used by physicians at the time to tell the health of their patients. I do this too. You know when it's clear and you feel like you're the most hydrated guy around? It's nice. I definitely don't taste it like the physicians back then though, or Saul Goodman in season 5 of Better Call Saul. I'll stick with apple juice for my favorite yellowish drink, thanks. Number 9, Belladonna, or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well truth be told it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least it was considered beautiful, I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret Secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines, combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, large pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight, Splash Zone. Let's get it on. Ooh, 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 baby. Let's get it on. Ooh. Man, I love that song. I love the classics. You know, sometimes those moments in life require that special soundtrack. Like when I'm gaming, I love synth pop. When I party, I'm a man enjoy some Drake. How you doing, buddy? And when it's time to get low. I like the official soundtrack of Shrek. <laughs> what can I say? Cinematic masterpiece. That being said, that's all that needs to happen in those intimate moments. For medieval times and in many places around the world, people would have to watch the signing off of the marriage. This included friends, family, local leaders, and maybe some nobility. You know, just to make sure the marriage uh, went through properly. <laughs> Gee, honey, I can't wait to go home and consummate the marriage. I figure if everyone shows up at 8, they can leave by 8.05. Maybe 802. Just stay out of the splash zone. Number seven, men's fashion. By far, one of the best ways to show that you are not one of the lowly plebeians back in medieval times would be your clothes. We've talked about how stripes were the pattern of the devil, but they had some weirder trends back in the Middle Ages. For example, long and pointy shoes were a very big sign of wealth, and the longer and pointier the shoe, the more gold pieces were lining your pocket. Men loved to show off their bodies back then, too. But they didn't have BMWs back in the day, so one way a dude could compensate for himself was the aptly named codpiece, which was a pouch attached to the front of a man's pantaloons, perfectly shaped and padded to display their masculinity. It's like that one dad at the beach wearing the speedo, except maybe a little less nightmare inducing. Number 6, Hairless. Nobody wants to go bald, just ask Jada Smith. Medieval times had different thoughts about this however. Not only was a receding hairline normal, but that was the thing for ladies at the time. You might be thinking it's all about the waist, the legs, or the booty. Well not back then. So if the forehead is all the rage, focus on it, right? Makes sense. How is this done? Well, you can start by plucking those lashes, don't need those, then pluck the eyebrows, ain't gonna need those either, and just start reeling back that hairline. Oh perfect, now you're ready for a night on the town. The history of women's fashion and traditions is a story of pain, beauty, and some really weird choices. Number 5, Animal Court. Oh, did you think the courtroom was a place only for members of the human species? <laughs> Au contraire. In fact, all kinds of members of the animal kingdom from insects to dolphins would stand trial if they were believed to be guilty of crimes. Some animals were executed, some received strongly worded letters, and some were even proven not guilty. A rooster was once given the verdict of guilty for laying eggs. Truly the most unnatural of crimes. Pigs were usually the ones who got the most amount of court time, with one account even having a pig dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, pants, and a human mask to meet his end. I wonder if these animals were judged by a jury of their peers. Hmm. Number 4, Bloodletting. Look, we all know that a lot of men in their mid 40s treat their bodies like a rusted out Chevy Tahoe. I'm one and the same. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, but dad got an oil change, so that makes it all that makes it all better. 
This was common back in medieval times. A simple fix or a one fix fits all for every health issue was of course bloodletting. The old drain you of your precious life juice so you can get a detox bro. Look at first glance yeah, it makes sense. If my Chevy runs a wee bit better after an oil change then why not? It makes sense. Well the truth is there really isn't any new blood going in so it's not so much as an oil change as it is so much just draining you of your energy bro. Did it really work? Ah, not really. Arguably it made things worse. This was also a treatment to make your skin pale and uh, as my previous point with the ladies that was also seen as beautiful so remember that. Go to blood clinic. Please don't drain your blood to look prettier. Number three, feast of fools. Before the church took the fun of going overboard out of pretty much everything, every January 1st in France the whole social hierarchy got topsy-turvy with the feast of fools. No, this was not a festival promoting fool related cannibalism. Instead, the highest respected religious officials swapped with the lowest and serving maids became masters with a king of misrule being crowned. The event was meant to display the biblical phrase, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Which is a creative excuse for parades, comic performances, costumes, cross dressing, song, and naturally, way too much drinking. But like I said, thanks to the rowdy merrymaking and obscenities, the church was forced to ban it. Sad. Number two, funeral rites. Medieval times, people were dropping like flies. Just how things went. So when it was time to deliver folks to their final resting place, some traditions were in order. For those that couldn't shake the Black Plague, they were put into big holes with the rest of the poor devils who couldn't also. Loved ones were taken care of with, well, great care and respect, and others well, they had uh, modifications made to their graves. Like for instance, if you were suspected of being a vampire, well, you'd be buried with a giant boulder on top of you, just in case, you don't know. Maybe you decide to wake up and come back to town for a midnight snack, gotta be careful. Some were buried without heads, uh, the list goes on. All I can say is keep your garlic close, your wooden stakes, and 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 just always wash your hands, especially when handling the recently deceased. That's, you gotta get a... Number one. Duke it out. Couples in medieval Germany had an interesting way of figuring out their differences. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took it to the octagon. Honestly, yeah, let's bring it back. Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, they had some great rules that had to be implemented. As one example, the husband had to stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife got to run around with a sack filled with rocks. Seems a bit unfair, but hey, to each their own. I just imagine every time I have an argument with a girlfriend, and right in the middle of it, we just stop like, okay, I've had enough. We're settling this with our fisticuffs. Consult the marital duel rule book and have at thee, foul beast. Number 10, the dancing plague. It was a normal summer day in 1518 Strasbourg when all of a sudden patient zero began to twitch and move in a way that was so peculiar. No, this isn't the start of a medieval zombie movie, which actually sounds pretty cool. This was a plague like no other, the dancing plague. A dancing woman shortly began to gather a crowd and more people seemed to strangely dance. More people joined in and then it became the dancing plague which lasted for days strangely. Some were taken in for medical treatment for the strange behavior. Today no one is really sure what happened. Some think it was the devil's work. Scientists today think it could have been a mold induced psychotic incident and other people think it could be just classic medieval hysteria. However, I like to think it was John Taverner's newest mixtape. Number 9. Rushed Wedding not all marriages back in the medieval times were for political and strategic gain. Some of it was actually for love. And some of it was extremely spontaneous. There wasn't even an official ceremony for a long time. And if you wanted to get married, the two of you just had to both give verbal consent, which is always a good idea. As you can imagine, this meant a lot of people would be getting legally bonded to each other in the streets, at the pubs, and while together in bed. Which... Mm, taking into account that people were considered old enough for marriage at obscenely young ages, they were not really thinking with their brains right then. But hey, life was short and love was fiery. But because of this, it was kind of hard to prove the whole thing. So we came up with a lovely way of confirming the whole situation. Number eight, 
weather witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. Nice, way to go, Eric, it's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to, to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah, or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker, he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just, he just vaulted his way over this new street dream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now, Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pole vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the terabithia to himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pole vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested. I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch. This would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12th, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go, and then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now, watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was 
was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of lock making, and early on, these things, they were units. They were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett, it hit him right in the forehead and the next day, Brett died of his injuries. Guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally, number one, horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point, but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. Right, you heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Hedlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know, we have like one big one, constantly busy. Yeah.